Welcome back to Intro to Religion, PHL 1030. We are going over Tim Bain's book, Philosophy of Religion, a very short introduction. In this video, we are talking about the problem of evil, and we'll be going over for exam one, part A, question seven, and part B, question 14. So question seven says, of part A, choose one of the three theistic responses to the problem of evil, and those are soul-making, laws of nature, and free will, and explain why it is less problematic than the other two. So, soul-making theodicy. Theodicy is the name of that branch of religious studies or religion or theology that studies how an all-good, all-powerful God could allow evil. And there's three responses that Tim Bain discusses in the book. Soul-making, theodicy, evils required to help make souls better so we can overcome obstacles. Laws of nature, that the laws of nature, in order for moral agents to exist, we must exist in a world that follows regularly repeating laws of nature so that we know the consequences of our actions but one of the unavoidable side effects of having a laws of nature or physical laws is occasional things like tornadoes earthquakes and hurricanes and drought and that causes evil that's another explanation and then finally free will god allows evil because he allows humans to have free will and we can choose to do whatever we want and sometimes we choose evil it would be a greater evil to take away free will than the evils that come about by granting us free will. So, which one of those seems less problematic than the other two? So describe all three, and which seems to have the least number of flaws. So we'll go over what Tim Bain discusses in the book on that. Part B, question 14 is, do you find Marilyn McCord Adams' beatific vision response to the problem of horrendous evils, plausible. Why or why not? So Marilyn Adams, she says, horrific evils, such as, for example, is a woman getting raped, then having her arms hacked off, and then being allowed to starve slowly to death. That's a horrific evil. There's nothing good that apparently could come of that for her life. So why would God allow it? And then her argument is, well, when that person dies, the beatific vision of God will be so overwhelmingly wonderful that it will absorb the evil suffering. So we'll get into that. But beginning with uh, the part A, question seven, about these three major theodicies, and this is the last question for part A. So again, she's one of the three theistic responses to the problem of evil, soul-making, laws of nature, free will, and explain why it is less problematic than the other two. So let's get into this chapter five, The Problem of Evil. Again, this is Tim Bain's book. Let me go back to this camera here, and I don't want to click it off. Okay, so chapter five, The Problem of Evil. And it begins with the subsection Epicurus's Challenge. But he begins with a story from Fyodor Dostoevsky's famous novel, The Brothers Karamazov in which we are told the story of an eight-year-old boy who accidentally wounds a general's hunting dog. In retaliation, the general orders his hounds to tear the boy to pieces in the presence of his mother. All right, so that's a horrific evil. Why would God allow that kind of evil to exist in the world? And so then that kind of a question was posed by the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 341 to 270 BCE, and here is his question. So the, the idea of this whole book is that let's assume that God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent, all good. The, the God of Abraham and the Abrahamic religions. So the existence of evil challenges that understanding of God, and here's why. According to Epicurus, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Is he neither able nor willing? 
then why call him God? Okay, so I think it's a, a nice summary of the problem of evil and the existence of an all-powerful, all-good God. If God is all good and all-powerful, evil shouldn't exist logically. That's the assertion. If God is all-powerful and evil exists, that means God is not all good. God likes a little bit of evil. If God is all good and evil exists, that means God is not all-powerful. God would prefer all, e all things only to be good, but he's not capable of making that happen. So how is it that God is all-powerful and all-good and allows evil to occur? So the three major theodicies, which is defenses of God, on page 66, Tim Baines says, other theorists offer an account of what they take God's actual reasons for allowing evil to be. Such accounts are known as theodicies. So, um, almost, all right, whether they are developed as defenses or theodicies, so defenses of, of God say, well, maybe God allows evil because of this. Theodicies say God does allow evil because of this. So, whichever way you categorize the defense, Almost all responses to the problem of evil involve an appeal to the greater good strategy. This is page 66. Uh, the idea is that the evil was necessary in order to bring about a greater good, and that that greater good absorbs the evil, is the word that he uses. Instances of evil, pain and suffering, that are not absorbed by some greater good can be described as unabsorbed. So what greater good absorbs evil and allows us to believe logically, to be logically consistent in believing in this all-powerful, all-good God. So the first theodicy being discussed is soul-making on page 66, and it goes like this. A world without suffering, it is claimed, would be a world without compassion, patience, tolerance, or forgiveness. These goods are known as second-order goods, for their exercise requires the presence of first-order evils. A world without evil would contain no opportunities for character development. That is the soul-making theodicy. So, is that plausible, that we require evil in order to become better people? I, am, I think it was Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, who we discussed in a previous video. One of his aphorisms in one of his books, or it might have been some other theologian, but at any rate, it was a piece of marble being chiseled by a hammer and a chisel, crying out, why are you torturing me? Why are you hacking into me like this? And the point was, this is what's necessary to transform you from an ill-formed slab of rock into some beautiful sculpture. So that's the soul-making theodicy. God allows <coughs> evils to exist to sculpt us into more perfect people. So there are some challenges to that. You know exactly how much evil is required okay a little bit of evil but when you have an eight-year-old boy torn to pieces by dogs in front of his mother how's that supposed to make the boy any better how is it supposed to make the mother any better more likely it's gonna make her come unhinged and just spread mental illness around so where's the soul making in that kind of intense evil maybe an evil like you get hit by a car accidentally by somebody or even on purpose, and you overcome all of the physical obstacles and achieve greatness that you might not have achieved had you not been challenged, maybe that would absorb the evil, but horrendous evils, it seems, would have a hard time um, being defended with a soul-making theodicy. So I'll read a little, some of the challenges that Tim Bain presents here on page 67, even when pain and suffering do prompt the development of character and the exercise of virtue, it is a further question whether these goods absorb the evils that give rise to them. You know, if you insult me, that gives me the opportunity to show compassion and forgiveness, but wouldn't it have been better if I hadn't insulted you in the first place, he asks. And so if God allows syphilis, starvation, and solitary confinement because of the opportunities they provide for moral development, then perhaps our attempts to eradicate these phenomena are misguided. So if you're going to say God uses evil to help sculpt souls into better people, then one implication is, well, then we shouldn't fight evil. Evil's good. You know, some of the most horrific evils have led to some of the greatest goods. So 
Maybe we should allow evils to continue so as to inspire the greatness that comes as a result. Um, and then here's another one. Even advocates of the soul making, this is page 68, even advocates of soul making theodicy can show that the benefits of soul making are absorbed by the badness of the evils that give rise to them. Why, one might ask why soul making is necessary in the first place. Why didn't God just create creatures who were innately disposed to display moral virtue? Why create us in such a way that we need to be sculpted? Can't you just make us good? So we'll get into the free will theodicy at a moment. But um, and then a final challenge, he says, would be to explain the pain and suffering inflicted on non-human animals and very young children. They can't learn from the pain that's inflicted upon them, and they're more likely to become fearful and aggressive. So those are some of the challenges to the soul-making theodicy. So now we move on to the laws of nature theodicy, or the natural law response. And page 69, the second paragraph, it says, At the heart of the natural law of response is the assumption that natural evils are a necessary consequence of having laws of nature. And without laws of nature, meaningful moral agency would be impossible. Laws of nature are needed for meaningful moral agency because meaningful moral agency requires knowledge of the consequences of our actions. And it is only if we have the capacity for meaningful moral agency that we have true responsibility which is in and of itself a great good. So, the natural law theodicy is saying the world had to be created according to physical laws that govern the universe. Otherwise, we would have a chaos and not a cosmos. In order for there to be moral agents, we have to understand the consequences of our actions based on our understanding of a law-governed universe. When you drop a rock off a bridge, it will fall. So if you go over a highway and drop a rock off a bridge onto a moving car, you know it's gonna fall onto that car and potentially kill somebody. So now, if you didn't know about that law of nature, you wouldn't have been able to make this moral decision. Am I gonna drop the rock off the bridge or not? This is something that children do time from time to time and people die, so we need a law-governed universe, and laws of nature are impersonal, and sometimes they lead to evil things. Not only human beings dropping rocks, but hurricanes, floods, and other kinds of natural disasters. But those are a necessary consequence of just having a law-governed universe. And again, a law-governed universe is required for moral agency, because we need to know the consequences of our actions. All right, the claim that we need to know the consequences of our actions to be moral agents is a big claim because there's a whole school of moral philosophers who say that the consequences of our actions have no moral bearing whatsoever. It's just our intentions that count. Immanuel Kant is the most famous proponent of that idea, the non-consequentialist moral theory that what makes something moral is the intention to obey the universal moral law in general. And whatever the consequences are, do what's right according to this universal moral law. I'm not going to get into any more of the details, but that's one potential flaw with the natural law theodicy. That why do we need to know the consequences of our actions? It's impossible really to know the consequences of our actions anyway. You never know what's going to happen with 100% certainty, but um, so at any rate, there's one potential challenge, and then here's a few others that Tim Bain discusses. He says, could a world without death, disease, and natural disasters not be law-governed? Why does the fact that you have a law-governed universe necessarily lead to disease and natural disasters? Um, and then he goes on to say, and even if it is, this is page 70, even if it is granted, that the knowledge needed for moral agency requires the existence of some natural evils, it is a further question whether acquiring that knowledge requires either the amount of natural evil that the world contains or the kinds of natural evil that it contains. Okay, so there's a couple of challenges to the natural law response, and with that we move on to the free will theodicy. 
This is page 70. Although both the soul-making and natural law responses have their advocates, by far the most influential response to the problem of evil is the free will response. And he mentions St. Augustine as one of the early proponents of the free will theodicy, although St. Augustine also was a skeptical of it. Um, so, for one thing, the free will theodicy only explains what's called moral evil, or the evil that human beings do. It doesn't explain natural evils. It wasn't any human's free choice that led to tornadoes and hurricanes. Um, so you can argue that it is. For example, if, if you want to argue that, oh, well, humans cause climate change and then that causes hurricanes and tornadoes, well, there's one way of a potential including free will theodicy with natural disasters, but let's just assume that natural disasters aren't a, a, a problem for human free will in general, so that's one challenge to the free will theodicy. It, it might explain moral evils, the evils that humans do, but it doesn't explain natural evils. It doesn't explain a comet hitting us from outer space, no matter what humans do on Earth to this planet. We can't control asteroids flying through uh, the universe. Um, so that's one challenge. And then you get into the challenges of, was it necessary to have free will to give us the ability to choose to do evil? Can't we be free and yet only have the option to choose good options? We could freely choose between a lot of different good things. Why not just take evil off the table and give us freedom to choose among a variety of good choices. Why isn't that possible? Um, so I would say, in response to that, that, and, and another one is the relationship between determinism and free will. Can God make it so that it's impossible for us to choose evil and yet still leave it open for us to choose good? And I bring that up now because I'm going to introduce the multiverse theory into this discussion, which was discussed in chapter three about cosmological arguments for God's existence. And I'll just parenthetically mention this here because I think it's an important avenue for these theodicies. So the, the argument for intelligent design most recently has been focused on the idea of the cosmological constant, which describes the expansion rate of space-time. It's described by a number with a decimal point, and I think 119 zeros and the 120th is a one, this extremely precise number that could not come about by chance if ours was the only universe. So if ours is the only universe, then that constant of nature seems to be fine-tuned by some intelligent designer. There seems to be no way out of admitting, yep, somebody perfectly aligned that constant of nature with all the others, the speed of light and all these other constants of nature that, just, that underpin the laws of nature. If, our, if there's only one universe, it certainly seems to be intelligently designed, fine-tuned perfectly for the emergence of life. However, if ours is only one in an infinite sea of parallel universes, then you can explain the apparent fine-tuning of our universe as just an incredibly improbable and yet ultimately inevitable consequence of chance. There's, a new, there's an infinite number of universes. All of them have different parameters of nature. Ours just so happen to have them all perfectly fine-tuned for life. Okay, so... If you accept the multiverse theory, then the implication is, here's where it originally was based in quantum mechanics from a man named Hugh Everett III in 1957. And he was analyzing the particle wave paradox of quantum mechanics. When you observe a, a quantum particle, it behaves like a little particle. This was the two-slit experiment I've talked about previously. When you're not observing it, it behaves like a wave of probability. It propagates through space like a liquid wave, but the wave is not made of liquid. It's made of mathematical probabilities, statistical probabilities for where a particle might appear or someone to observe that wave. 
So Hugh Everett the third asked, well, when you observe it and it collapses into one point in that wave, most likely at the peak, but it could be anywhere, and the, the wave stretches out asymptotically to infinity, so it could be anywhere at all, what happens to all the potential points, which were equally real potentials, what happens to them when the wave collapses into just one point? Hugh Everett said, well, it makes just as much mathematical sense to assume that when the wave collapses into a particular particle here, it collapses into another position in that little wave of probability in a parallel universe. The only difference between the two being the position of that one particle. And that there are innumerable universes in every wave of probability, and the position of the particle in that wave manifests in all parts of that wave in one universe or another, and when you extrapolate that outward and the consequences are that every possible combination of atoms is manifest in one universe or another. So every possible historical scenario in your life and your nation's life do occur in one universe or another. So these are the string theorists are propagating this theory and they are and the ones who are propagating it the most that I've seen are atheists. So they don't believe in God, but they believe that there is a parallel universe with all of us doing exactly the same things with just the one particle being in a slightly different position somewhere in the universe. So ever so finely sliced differences expanding out to infinity. So that is the current cosmology. That is the culmination of 20th century physics that unites quantum mechanics and general relativity and string theory, this parallel universe's cosmology. And it brings a lot to the theodicy debate of free will. So can determinism and free will coexist? If God knows the past, the present, and the future, how can you possibly have free will? I'm going to walk the dog tomorrow. Well, if God knows I'm walking the dog tomorrow, I have no freedom not to do that. That's an eternally known fact. If you enter the parallel universes theory in, I walk the dog tomorrow. I don't walk the dog tomorrow in another universe. I walk the dog and take a slight turn to the left, down one street, down another street. Every possible minute possibility of me walking the dog or not walking the dog does occur in one universe or another. And it seems to me that that kind of understanding is required for God's omniscience. If God knows everything, that means God knows every possible potential scenario and combination of atoms that could conceivably exist, which means God must know every possible evil scenario that one could possibly imagine. And if your imagination is infinitely powerful, you're going to imagine infinitely horrible things. And if you didn't, you'd be limited in your knowledge. So for God to be omniscient, it's necessary for God to at least imagine the most horrific scenarios. And God's imagination is reality. So what we experience here is the worst evils ever. Hitler's genocides and the torture chambers of Syria. These are some of the examples Tim Bain mentions in the book. Those were all necessary possibilities encoded in the megaverse of universes that and, and those in every other potential evil as well as every possible good thing all of it must be manifest at least in god's imagination so if this world is god's imagination that was another theory that we discussed previously in the book and if god's imagination is infinite then it's necessarily a fact that god must imagine the worst and most horrific evils and that the great good of God's omniscience absorbs the necessity of him imagining horrific evils. So there's one potential theodicy when you add in the megaverse theory. And it's also, I think, required for free will. God knows everything that seems to obviate free will. But if God knows everything, but God knows an infinite, unbounded series of scenarios from which you can choose, then you have the infinite extremes of determinism and free will. Anything you choose to do, you're free to do anything you can imagine. But anything that you can imagine, God has already imagined. But there's no limit to it. It's not that you have a finite set of choices, only good ones, and you can't choose any of the evil. You have an infinite number of good choices, an infinite number of evil choices, and so you're totally free to choose. 
And yet at the same time, each of those is eternally known in God's omniscient mind. So everything is totally determined. It seems to be this paradoxical union of the infinite extremes of determinism and free will. So once you throw in the megaverse idea into the theodicy equation, I think things can start to get pretty interesting. Um, okay, so I will, um, now with that in mind, I'm going to read, this is Mackey's challenge from J.L. Mackey. He says this at the bottom of page 71, if God has made men such that in their free choices, they sometimes prefer what is good and sometimes what is evil, why could he not have made men such that they always freely choose the good? If there is no logical impossibility in a man's freely choosing the good on one or on several occasions, there cannot be a logical impossibility in his freely choosing the good on every occasion. God was not then faced with a choice between making innocent automata and making beings who, in acting freely, would sometimes go wrong. There was open to him the obviously better possibility of making beings who would act freely but always go right. Clearly, his failure to, avail, to avail himself of this possibility is inconsistent with his being both omnipotent and wholly good. So I don't agree. Uh, he's saying that God could have made it so that we always freely choose the good. Again, here's, to say that God isn't all, the, the existence of evil means God can't be all good and all powerful. That's the claim. And, it, and people take it so far as to say the existence of evil therefore says there is no God. Well, for one thing, if there's no God, neither is there an absolute moral standard of good and evil. To claim that, oh, evil exists and therefore God does not exist is logically inconsistent. Because if evil exists, so does goodness. Neither evil nor good are empirically observable physical phenomena their ideas. So if they have reality, why doesn't the idea of an omnipresent spirit named God have reality? An omnipresent moral standard is there, but no God to support it. It's illogical. If there's no God, then neither is there good or evil. And evil doesn't require an explanation. It's a purposeless mechanical universe. This is the standard neo-Darwinian theory. Things happen. It's not good or evil. We invent these moral terms. So... The existence of evil doesn't disprove the existence of an all-good God. It proves the existence of a moral standard of good and evil, which implies the existence of God. If there's pain and suffering that has no explanation, maybe you're saying that indicates no God. Okay, that makes more sense. But I wouldn't call pain and purposeless pain and suffering evil because that's an absolute moral term, which makes no sense in the, absolute, in the absence of an absolute moral standard or judge. Um, and again, I've discussed earlier that if God is omniscient, God must know every conceivable possibility of historical sequences, including the most horrific evils. Otherwise, God is not omniscient. So um, I would say that's another reason God's omniscience requires him imagining horrific evils, our free will requires our ability to choose to enact those horrific scenarios as well as the terribly good things that we can possibly do. So does free will and God's omniscience, are those greater goods that absorb the evils by making them ne a necessary part of free will and God's omniscience? I tend to say they do because it wouldn't be logically possible for God to be omniscient without those possibilities of horrible evil, and it wouldn't be possible for us to be absolutely free if we didn't have total freedom to choose to do any conceivable thing that God can possibly imagine. So I would say that they do absorb the horrific evils. Um, it's easy for me to say when I'm not having my arms hacked off and starving to death, but... Um, just logically, that's that's how I would respond to those challenges. Okay, so those were the three major theodicies that were covered in Part A. Question 7 for exam 1. Choose one of the three theistic responses to the problem of evil. Soul-making, laws of nature, or f and free will. 
and explain why it is less problematic than the other two. So which one of, the, which one of those three presents fewer problems than the other two? So the soul-making one, I think, has more problems. Sure, overcoming obstacles makes us a better person, but having a boy ripped apart by dogs doesn't seem to me to make anybody any better. It could, and you could easily imagine scenarios. Well, the soldiers watching after that, they gave up their life of sin and they left the evil general or so it's some souls could be helped out by observing some horrific evils like that but not that eight-year-old boy's soul not the mother's soul most likely all right so that one has some problems it's got some plausibility but it's also got a lot of problems the laws of nature idea um if you throw in the multiverse theory into the laws of nature then I think it has greater potential for absorbing evil. The laws of nature require a megaverse of parallel universes, which I think would be required of an omniscient God to imagine every conceivable combination of atoms. That's the megaverse. And that also indicates every conceivable evil and every conceivable good. So how plausible is that? Well, how plausible is the multiverse theory? How plausible is it even that if there's only one universe that it that the law that God had to allow evils to exist in order for it to be law governed? We went over that and you can discuss the challenges. Tim Bain brought up free will theodicy, the most famous one of all. God allows humans at least to create to commit evil acts because if he prohibited us from doing that, we wouldn't have free will. And the lack of free will would be a greater evil than the evils that free will allows to happen. So, um, again, I threw in the multiverse theory into that scenario that we have to have free will to choose anything, but anything we choose in this universe, some version of us will choose the exact opposite and everything, every choice in between in the infinite number of parallel universes. So a question that comes up with that is, well, Am I the same person as the one acting in a next door universe? We have all the same thoughts or am I different? And that's one potential question that comes up with the multiverse theory, but I've gone over that enough. I think I'm going to move now to part B question 14. Do you find Marilyn McCord Adams beatific vision response to the problem of horrendous evils plausible? Why or why not? So on page 74, up at the top, Tim Bain says, under a subsection, horrendous evils, I'm going to click back to this camera. It says, one final challenge to the free will response, indeed, to all greater good responses, takes the form of what the philosopher Marilyn McCord Adams, who lived from 1943 to 2017, has called horrendous evils. So Adams gives an example of such evils. As an example, the rape of a woman and the axing off of her arms, psychophysical torture whose ultimate goal is the disintegration of personality and slow death by starvation. In each case, the evil that the person has suffered threatens to overwhelm her life and render it meaningless. So, Adams points out in the middle of the next paragraph that most theistic traditions are committed to a creature-centered conception of God's goodness according to which God's goodness ensures that each creature's life is good for that creature. Horrendous evils pose an acute challenge to this aspect of God's goodness for their victims have reason to doubt whether their own life has been good for them. As Dostoevsky's character Ivan asks in The Brothers Karamazov, why should abused children be made to pay for the harmony of the world? So then Adams, she says, here's the problem. There seems to be no answer for these horrific evils. And then she draws on her Christian tradition and she argues that only post-mortem intimacy with God, the beatific vision referred to by mystics such as Julian of Norwich, would be able to defeat horrendous evils. And thus that the theist has decisive reason to think that divine intimacy of this kind obtains. The fact that there are such horrific evils that occur could only be absorbed by some ultimate consolation prize in the afterlife. That's what she's saying. This beatific vision of God is so wonderful 
that it heals all wounds, even the most horrific evils. So is that plausible? On page 75, Tim Bain says, one problem is that even if the goodness of the beatific vision outweighs the badness of horrendous evils, it doesn't absorb those evils unless they are necessary for the beatific vision. And Adams does not explain why such evils might be necessary for the beatific vision or any other good for that matter. Why, when it's tempted to ask, couldn't God have created us in a state in which we already enjoy the beatific vision? And then a second challenge concerns the notion of the afterlife. Okay, so why would horrific evils be necessary in order for us to have the beatific vision? I will again point to God's omniscience. The beatific vision of God is the vision of God as the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent being. If God couldn't imagine every conceivable scenario, God would not be omniscient, and therefore the vision of God would not be beatific. It would lack something, namely omniscience. So the greater good of omniscience absorbs the horrific evils that God must necessarily imagine in order to have omniscience. That's how I would argue in this instance. And the idea of an afterlife, well, yeah, that's that. we'll discuss that in chapter 8 of the book, which will be the next video. Um, but I will point to the near-death experiences of people who see this beatific vision of this all-embracing, infinitely powerful, all-loving light at the end of a dark tunnel. The light at the end of the tunnel, people describe it as uniting with the entire cosmos, the past, the present, and future. You know all, you become one with everything, and you're infused with a sense of universal love, infinitely overwhelming love, and that everything that led up to it is absorbed in this infinite love. Is, is, were the evils necessary for that infinite love to exist? I'm saying yes, in order for God to be omniscient. Um, and the so I'm, I'm just thinking of this this so the idea of this light at the end at the end of the tunnel in previous videos i've shown that that's also what relativity theory says you would perceive if you could travel at light speed so people have these near-death experiences they say oh my heart stopped my consciousness rose above my body above the building where i died above the planet and then I was hurtling through space faster and faster until I saw this light at the end of a dark tunnel. Relativity says, if you travel near light speed, you'll see all the stars, even the ones directly behind you, pulled into a single point containing the past, the present, the future of the whole universe at the end of a dark tunnel. So I think natural theology, the study of nature, that parallel between relativity theories speed of light travel and near-death experiences i think gives makes it plausible that the people who see this light at the end of the tunnel on these near-death experiences it's more plausible to me that they actually do see that because of that parallel with the laws of physics and the laws of physics was another part of this um of this theodicy so i think i've covered enough and we only have one more video which will be about the theory of resurrection.